Okay, this video is for section 7.2, which is about the means and variances of random variables. And right away, we're going to introduce a, a new symbol that seems a little bit goofy, but I think it'll make sense. It's mu of x. So if you read this as mu of x or mu sub x, and this is the mean of the random variable. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, remember last video, I introduced this variable x that was the number of hearts you get in a uh, five-card poker hand. Well, I think we'd agree that every time you deal a five-card poker hand, you might, you're going to get, it's random, so you're going to get different numbers of hearts in each hand, perhaps. Um, the mean of x, or mu of x, is the average number of hearts you would get in many, many, many hands. Okay? Um, remember my example of y, the random variable y, was the weight of an apple you pick off a tree. Well, mu of y would be the average weight of apples. If you picked many, many, many apples and figured the average of all the apples, on average, how much would they weigh? Uh, that's the idea of the mean of a random variable. You take many, many, many instances or events or outcomes of that random variable and average them all together in the long run. Sigma of x, or the standard deviation of the random variable, is a little bit harder to think about. Think about my example of... Uh, the five card poker hands x. What's the standard deviation of the number of hearts you would get? Okay, that's a little bit harder to think about, but we know standard deviation is the average distance from the mean. So that means on average, how many, what's the distance between the number of hearts you got in this hand, or in each hand, and the average number of hearts? And then Again, for the weight of apples, it's a little bit easier to think about what's the standard deviation of all the apples you pick off the tree in the long run. So the question you were probably thinking was, well, how do we figure out mu of x and sigma of x? Well, it turns out there's a formula, and this is probably the worst-looking formula we've seen so far, so let me kind of walk you through it. Here's the formula for mean of x, and by the way, this is only the formula for discrete random variables. For continuous random variables, we'll talk about it in about two or three slides. So we're only talking about discrete random variables where it's like a staircase. There's a so there's some number of outcomes. Okay? So uh, what we do is the mean of x, and this is outcome times probability. The x sub 1 is the first outcome, and then p sub 1 is the probability that, that outcome happens. Plus, and you basically do that for each outcome. So the way I like to think about this formula is it's just outcome times probability. And you can see that, and you basically add those all up. This is the sigma notation, is add up for each i. i is kind of like a counting variable. x1 times p1 plus x2 times p2 plus x3 times p3 and so on. The formula for uh, standard deviation is much, much yuckier. So here it is, and it turns, first of all, the thing to notice right away is it's in terms of standard deviation squared, which you remember is the idea of variance. And basically you do, and yuck, outcome minus mean squared times probability. And we'll do this once and probably let our calculator do it from then on. But here's the actual formula. Sigma of the outcome minus the mean squared times the probability. It's a yucky formula, so let's do an example of both of them. Okay, here's some data we used, an example we used in the previous video. So we're going to say that let x is going to be the number of people in a household. We're only going to use the top row. We're not going to look at the bottom row. And so the directions are find mu of x. That's the average number of people in each household. So what we do is we use the formula we just learned on the previous page. It's outcome times probability and add those all up. So the first outcome is 1, and the probability of that happening is 0.25. The second outcome is 2, and the probability of that happening is 0.32. Plus 3 times 0.17 plus 4 times 0.15, and then I'll just write a dot, 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 plus dot, dot, dot. And you basically would do that for each one. And just trust me that if you do this, it'll all end up to be about 2.6. And so 2.6 is the average number of people in each family. should have mentioned before, actually, you may think, well, what about families with 8, 9, 10, or, you know, more people than that? Well, it turns out the chart just cuts off here. The probability of that happening is so low, it's less than 1%, so we're just ignoring them.
Now you might say, well now let's do the second part of this. Let's find and fi find sigma of x. Okay, this is a much harder. Um, so it turns out sigma of x, we, the formula doesn't involve sigma of x, the standard deviation. Again, it involves the variance. So we're going to find the variance first and then square root to find the standard deviation. So what we do is we do outcome minus the mean, which we just found to be 2.6, squared times the probability, which is 0.25, plus outcome 2, mean is 2.6 squared times the probability is 0.17. I'll do one more. Uh, we get outcome minus mean squared times point I'm sorry, this was a mistake over, excuse me here, this must, this was the wrong number. I'm sure some of you were probably thinking what I was doing. This should be 0.32. This one's 0.17. And you basically do that for each outcome. And if you do this, you get about 2.02. Now that's the variance, it's not the standard deviation. Or variance is standard deviation squared. So now to find the standard deviation of x, I would do the square root of 2.02 and I get about 1.421. Let's leave it at that. Um, on class, I'll show you a way that the calculator can do both of these things for you. Although I, you might want to do it, be able to do it for a, kind of a small group of numbers. So the formulas I just showed you are for discrete random variables. You may be thinking, well, what about continuous random variables? Because actually, obviously, you can't add up every outcome for a continuous random variable. Well, it turned out that problem is just it's much more complicated, and there is no exact formula for it. Um, the real way to do it involves some calculus and things like that that we're not going to talk about in this class. We will probably talk about in some situations where the distribution is a normal distribution, then they'll just give you these numbers. There is no real formula for them. Um, and we really will only, the most common continuous random variables we will talk about will be normal normal random variables, and so they'll just probably just give us those numbers. As we talk about the things like the mean of x, uh, I told you that actually that really means in the long run. You have to deal out lots of poker hands, or you have to pick lots of apples off the trees. This relates to something called the law of large numbers that I want to just talk about in the next two slides. And so before I give you kind of a definition for it, I want to kind of explain this graph. So it turns out that the average height of women is about five foot four and a half. It's 64.5 inches. And what they've done here is they've simulated something where they've said, okay, let's pick some number of women and then calculate for each, let's calculate X bar. Now X bar is a sample mean, right? This is a sample mean. I'm distinguishing this from the symbol mu, which is a population mean. So what they've done is for each time they've picked some women, they've calculated x bar. Well, then this graph basically shows you lots of different x bars for lots of different sample size n's. And what you notice is actually when n is small, like for 5 women or 10 women, the x bar actually was below 64.5. Okay? In fact, pretty significantly below. It was, you know, it was almost an inch away. Right? Um, but then as the sample size increases, what did you notice? And it wasn't so surprising, this line eventually became pretty darn close to 64.5. Not exactly close, but as you got 10,000 women, it became really, 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 really close. That idea is called the law of large numbers. And what we're talking about is that as you pick large values of n, the sample mean, x bar, gets very, very, very close to mu, which is the population mean. This dashed line is the population mean mu. This jagged graph is all the possible x bars. And what you're noticing as you pick many, many, many women, turns out it's not surprising that x bar is going to get pretty close to mu. Um, that's the idea of the law of large numbers. And so we're going to be, I wanted to see you to see this graph first. Now, sometimes the graph doesn't always go down, right? You can imagine a case where, you know, the first one you'd pick would be really tall, and then, well, I guess it wouldn't do that, okay? But it might be kind of tall up here, and then, okay, and then you get closer and closer and closer and closer and closer. It might look like that. Or conceivably, it might even look something like, you know, okay, the first one's really tall, and then it does this, and then it kind of gets closer and closer and closer. I suppose it could even be the case that it's right on the line. But that's the idea is, 
you see a lot of variability as for small values of x, but once you get large values of sorry, you get a lot of variability in small values of n, but as n gets really, really big, uh, it gets very, very close to mu. Okay, here's the words of the law of large numbers. I think the graph is easier to understand. But you take independent observations from a population with mean mu, right? Mu is always the population mean. As the sample size n increases, the sample mean, that's x bar, approaches mu. That's just the words of the law of large numbers. And I want to just kind of mention this, that people, there is no such thing as the law of small numbers which kind of works the other way. People sometimes think of like if you're rolling a die or you're flipping a coin, like, you know, oh, look, I got three heads in a row. I'm due for uh, getting a tails. Well, no, you aren't. It turns out thinking you're due to get a tails is thinking there is such thing as the law of small numbers. In the short run, we would not expect any kind of evenness of distribution to come out. In the short run, you can be, have x bar can be wildly varied from mu. The law of large numbers says in the long run, that's what we mean. And so gamblers sometimes think that there's such a thing as the law of smaller numbers. Hey, you know, I, I should play one more hand because I'm due to win, because the odds of me winning are this, and I haven't won in a long time. No, you haven't played enough hands yet. Yeah. You're due to win in the long run, but you're never due to win in the short run.